This morning, good to see you all. Uh, we'll begin our service with the opening hymn. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most Most merciful God. God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and be us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a culinary servant of Christ and by his authority, 
I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the Son. Glory, Glory be to, to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 49. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, in his quiver he hid me away, and he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, You formed me from the womb to be his servant. 
to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ for the Gospel.
mercy and peace be unto you from God the Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this morning is taken from the first chapter of St. John. You know, it's not about the pastor. That's what John said. John said, it's not about me, it is about Jesus, who John calls the Lamb of God. I'm paraphrasing, and you can say that any preaching from a text in the Bible, which is what I do, is paraphrasing, explaining what's going on in the text. We have recently and often heard John the baptizer say of himself and Jesus things like, he must increase and I must decrease. He also said, I'm not good enough to carry his shoes. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. John's baptism was a good thing. His would be better. I baptize with water for repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And here, John says, after me, comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me, says the man who was born six months before the other man. If I thought the number 70, 73,280, does that mean anything to any of you? I'll give you a hint. I didn't give him a hint in Grand Mound. If you've ever hauled grain, that number 73,280 means something to you. That number was changed to 80,000 in 1974. In the beginning, William Cronin talks about this in his book, Nature's, uh, Nature's, uh, yeah. In the beginning, he says, farmers took their grain to market. They loaded it into burlap bags with your name on each bag, and you put it into your wagon. And depending on the size of the wagon, maybe 50 bags, 50 pounds each, ton and a quarter of grain. And then it went to the river, just like you do today. Same river, or well, maybe you don't today. Then, down the levee to St. Louis, to the levee, which is still there. And from there, the grain went off to the world. When the railroad came through here, you could take your bags to town and they made their way by rail to Chicago, where corn and the like became a commodity and was blended. Trains got larger and larger. Bridge failure and death were common. The government bridge was built to last. I read that it's about 10 times as strong as it needed to be. That bridge is gonna be there for a while. Today, the average three-hopper railroad car used to be 200,000 pounds. Now it carries 220,000 pounds of grain and a 100 car train, 220,000 pounds each. That's a lot of weight, isn't it? That's a lot of weight. The internet says that a barge today holds 52,000 bushels of grain. They're probably talking about beans. I think it used to be 40,000 and we could load one in a day. It was a long day. Got a little help sometimes from the Postian brothers, but I only ever saw one Postian. And take your average 15 barge tow, do the math, I think 12,500 tons. That's pretty heavy. That's a lot of weight. So 73,280, that was the maximum gross vehicle weight for a truck. Put the fuel in first, don't forget the driver. He's not crossing any scales. 80,000 now, 80,000. So, how many beans do you think are in the world total? And let's just count the soybeans, leave out the green beans. How many beans in the world? How many kernels of corn? And if you added to that all the rice in the world and all the wheat in the world, how many separate pieces would you have? Quite a few. And how much would that all weigh? Quite a bit. So that's how much sin is in the world. That's how much sin is in the world. 
The Apostle John does not have a birth narrative per se of Jesus, Matthew and Luke do, and we have heard them a lot, especially from Luke. Mark does not talk about the birth of Jesus. John gets a little bit creative. And if you're here on Christmas Day, you heard that taking us back to Genesis, taking us back to how in the beginning was the word. And he goes on like that, keeping us sort of in suspense until verse 14 when he says the word. What's the word? The word becomes flesh and dwelt among us. I thought that's what it was. He's talking about Jesus. Talking about Jesus. So John does that, the apostle, the writer of this book. Then he goes Tom Clancy introducing Jesus and then John and then back and forth. And you wonder when these two characters are going to come together. And we saw that last week. Jesus came to John to be baptized by him, and that did happen. And like everybody else, at that baptism of Jesus, John heard what he heard and saw what he saw. And now, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. When John says... When John saw the newly baptized Jesus approaching him, to anybody within earshot, he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I would say behold, but that's not the way we talk. The word means, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what do you suppose people thought when they heard John say that about Jesus, calling him the Lamb of God? And he uses that phrase a little bit later, the Lamb of God, the only two times it's written in the Bible, the Lamb of God in the New Testament. Well, what they thought then and there would be different from what you and I would think today. Like if I saw somebody coming down the aisle and proclaim, look, the Lamb of God, you would turn around and expect to find Jesus. Because of John's proclamation and the familiar phraseology, Jesus as the Lamb of God, we understand that now. When John spoke to those people at that time in that place about the Lamb of God, they probably thought he was talking about the Passover Lamb. The Passover Lamb was to be young and spotless, perfect as unblemished could be, and the Passover Lamb, you may recall, was to be slaughtered and its blood painted above the outside door to your house to save your firstborn from death at the hand of the angel of death. Finally, along with bread and wine, the flesh of the Passover lamb was, lamb was to be eaten every year as a remembrance of that salvation God had gotten them out of slavery in Egypt and made them his people. So the Passover lamb. Probably not as many of them, but some scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders and Bible scholars, might have been familiar with other references in the Old Testament to a lamb. You may have heard Isaiah's talk about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter. Jeremiah also, in speaking of the coming Messiah, speaks of one like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. Look, the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. Um, how many sins are in the world? Quite a few. Heavy load, that verb. The translations all take away, say take away, and that's right. Specifically, to lift up, to make movement, to carry away, to move something like you do with a truck or a railroad car or a barge, to move it. The Lamb of God lifts up, carries, removes the sin of the world. The sin of the world. That's a lot of sin. That's a heavy load. And you know, a lamb is not known to be a beast of burden. They're actually kind of rather frail. All time, how many individual sins are we talking about here? The sins of the world. Quite a few. That's how many. How much would that sin weigh? 
quite a bit. We hosted the Winkel up at uh, Grand Mound on Tuesday, so I didn't make it to the one here. I guess it was at Risen Christ. And the pastors from the eight churches that make up the Clinton circuit, and the four of us talked about this text and this verse. That's what we kind of do. And somebody's stream of consciousness led him to ask, which of John Calvin's errors do you find the most egregious? And I said, irresistible grace. That's the worst one. That's where God says, you don't want to be a Christian? You're going to be a Christian whether you like it or not. That's irresistible grace. I talk all the time about how the Christians don't do forced conversions except John Calvin's God. So the particular doctrine of John Calvin in error laid bare by this verse is his teaching of limited atonement. That means that he taught that Jesus died for the sins of Christians, but not for the rest of, uh, the, rest of the world. Here, John is saying that the Lamb of God hauled away the sins of the world. The world. And then somebody pointed out that the Calvinists and their plethora of theological descendants have to work their way around a lot of Bible verses like this that don't agree with their doctrine. It's true. I think what's even more profound about John the Baptist's teaching that Jesus died for the sins of all people, all times, all places, is how John has used that word, the world, so far in his gospel. The word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And then John says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. And throughout his book, when John talks about the world, he's he talking about what I talk about when I say the culture. The world, the culture, the opposition to Jesus and his followers that's always going to be out there. So the Bible teaches that Jesus died for the sins of the culture. Those who hate him and his followers, even their sins, he died for. We call that theological term objective justification. It means that all sins have been paid for, but if you won the lottery, but you don't believe or even know that you won the lottery, doesn't do you much good. Or the show, Bill Gravia, very good show, where the man who was the rightful Earl of Brockenhurst, but he didn't know that he was the rightful Earl of Brocken Brockenhurst, so no land, no manor house, no entitlement. The bill for your sins has been paid, but if you don't know it or refuse it, and a lot of people are just, I'd rather do it myself. I'd rather do it myself. I don't need anybody to help me with that stuff. And when you become and remain a Christian, you do know, you do believe, you do accept the free gift of salvation and eternal life. We call that subjective justification. You yourself, your specific sins have been hauled away, dumped into a pit somewhere. The weight of your sin was hauled away by Jesus, the Lamb of God. In the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, the main issue of the Reformation, Justification by faith or works. That was the issue. Uh, speaking of the Lutherans, the Augsburg Confession says they teach that men cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight. And then, on the heels of Augsburg 4, justification by faith, Augsburg 5, that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted 
For through the word and sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Ghost is given, who works faith, where and when it pleases God, in them that hear the gospel, to wit, that God, for Christ's sake, justifies those who believe. Subjective justification. And you wonder if John is thinking along similar lines. More likely the confessions were thinking along John's lines. John talks about the Lamb of God who takes away from the sins of the world on one day, and then the next day we have Jesus going out and securing men to do just that, to proclaim the word, to go to seminary with him for three years and then go out and preach the gospel that people might be saved. He chose people like Andrew and his brother Peter, then Philip, and Nathaniel, also James and John, and John's the one who wrote this book, the book of John. Why those 12? Why those people? Well, about half of them, seven if you count Thomas, are in the fishing business, and at least four of the 12 own their own boats. But don't read too much into that. The fishing business fed them in that time and place, like the ag industry feeds us in this time and place, a lot of people were involved in the fishing business. Uh, I think still like three years ago, 40% of our elders at Grand Mound are farmers. That's one in two halves, I think, out of five. It's gonna go down to 30 when the new guy's installed. So those 12, why those 12? Fishermen? because there were a lot of them. Matthew's a tax collector. Simon was a political activist. John would have us to think that Judas was a professional thief before he became an apostle. Not surprisingly, the word that Jesus and John preached, it was the same thing spread from John to his disciples. Andrew was one of John's disciples, and he went and told his brother, Peter about Jesus, a very high percentage of people come into the church like that through relatives, through friends. That's how people come into the church. By pastors, not so much. If I invite somebody to church, I'm just doing my job. If I invite somebody to church, it's like the review from the seller on Amazon. I want to see what people have bought into a church what does their review say about that church? And that's how people are. And not all the apostles are the same. To the 12, we added 70. And then others in the New Testament who called themselves apostles. You saw Paul called himself an apostle, starting out his letter to the Corinthians. And not all apostles are the same. Peter. Peter's the, the apostle too impetuous to play it safe. Paul is the outsider who fought for recognition. James and John were ambitious. So was their mother, Jesus' aunt. And they were told by him that with great power comes great responsibility. And they said, we're in, and they were. John the baptizer was a very popular figure. But John knew that it was not about him. It was about Jesus. And he finds a lot of ways to steer their attention away from himself and towards Jesus. I think Paul talks about himself more than any of the apostles, but it's never about Paul. It's always about Jesus, and he always says so. A writings called the Didache, 12 writings from the early church out right after the apostolic age. Uh, good stuff. Well, we don't know much about those 12 writers because they don't talk much about themselves. Augustine does an autobiography, uh, and it is about him, but it's not a pretty picture. It's called Confessions, and he does. Not talking himself up, talking Jesus up. And with all of them, it's always about Jesus and not all apostles, not all church fathers, not all pastors are the same. So, you know, we're going through the calling process here. And I guess Emmanuel, Charlotte, have some names. 
And I seem to have looked through a lot of piffs and sets in my time, the personal information file and the self-evaluation tool. Um, seen a lot of those in the church, I have noted, has sent a playthrough of different men to different places over the years. Not all pastors are the same. Not all churches are the same. And for all of us, it's about Jesus. And when John and I say things like that, and that I'm just a guy who is a placeholder in the office of pastor at Emmanuel Grand Mound, unworthy to carry anything of Jesus, I say we pastors need to stay in our lane. It's not about us. It's why I wear the rope to cover up the man. I may be wearing my Calvin Klein slim fits under this robe or my pajamas, you don't see it. That's the point. The pulpit is here to cover me and to put the focus on the word proclaimed, not the proclaimer. And not all proclaimers are the same either. I've said that. The other side of that coin is that nor should the non-pastors make it about the pastor who is a placeholder in this office. What I've seen is that people will take one or two negatives and uh, just kind of run with it. Just kind of run with it about the pastor. I've also seen people just kind of make things up. I think there's a word for that. Is he a faithful shepherd who proclaims the word in its truth and purity? Does he point us to Jesus, the good shepherd? People hear me talking like that and they wonder if something's going on. Something going on? Yes, something is going on. What's going on is that I'm doing what I do every Sunday. This is the appointed gospel reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany in series C. And I'm telling you what it says. That's what's going on here. That our sins are great. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise and we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, all weary. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Uh, some of you maybe already know that Bill Fries has um, been having troubles. He's over at, um, used to be Banner Ridge, and now it's something else, ProMedic or something, doing therapy, and uh, hopes to return home at some point. So we keep Bill in our prayers. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servants, Bill, Kevin, Pastor Brondis, Lexi, Dorothy, Richard, Liz, Brent, Jeff, Alan, Sherry, Marcia, Lori, Miranda, Mary, Paula, Kathy, Sue, Wanda, Jean, Stella, Tyler, Norma, and Brian. Assure them of your mercy, deliver them from the temptations of, of the evil one, and give them patience and comfort in their illnesses. 
If it please you, restore them to health or give them grace to accept these tribulations with courage and hope. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all people everywhere, we give you humble and sincere thanks for the innumerable blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us your saving word in the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and provide faithful pastors to preach your word with, with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to those who do not know you. In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools, so that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue, and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Accept, we implore you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. Grant your Holy Spirit, as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come. Doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. This time we receive the offerings. Be seated.
our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.